we are looking at the theme of building resilient livelihoods in the face of changing climate and disasters. Livelihoods is not one area, you know. Livelihoods is a system. And we need to apply that system's approach. And that's why I welcome this, uh, this initiative that, you know, the private sector, the government, the UN agencies, the NGOs all come together. The G G20 Indian presidency, which is putting such an important focus on, um, you know, green development and resilience, uh, absolutely as well. Um, in fact, we're very pleased uh, to, to see that India has uh, created a um, disaster risk reduction working group within the G20 architecture for the first time. So that's really, really showing uh, the, the premium uh, focus that India is placing on, on these issues. At Reliance Foundation, we have been consistently focusing on supporting vulnerable communities through technology and data-driven early warning advisories. The foundation has captured its learnings and synthesized those in a report called Disaster Management Approaches Towards Resilient Communities, Learnings from Reliance Foundation's Experiences. This report is an effort to share our experiences and learnings and encourage a dialogue on the ways to strengthen disaster risk reduction initiatives. We hope uh, you find the report valuable to this discourse as there is immense opportunity to build on this commitment. Uh, four key aspects that appear to me when we look at uh, the livelihoods uh, in context of uh, climate extremes and um, uh, disasters. One is that the crisis recovery, so it's a kind of a event-centric, very quick, very quick kind of thing, maybe a few days or maybe a, uh, a week or so. Uh, second aspect that uh, uh, the uh, within the sectoral management system, that uh, the, the term that we have, the change management, basically looking at that, how do we adjust other things? And the third aspect that how we do uh, do we look at alternatives? Uh, because many times when uh, the disasters affect that uh, livelihood, uh, when we say bring back better, we, we are not able to bring back the same set of the opportunities. So how do we look at the adjustment with the alternatives? And the fourth, uh, fourth aspect that appeared to me is a long-term recovery. Multi-stakeholder partnerships and using digital platforms, capacity building, and addressing the livelihoods of the communities. Now that uh, uh, that uh, based on that uh, what's us our inputs. Now our focus is about that uh, uh, is about mostly about the hazard risk vulnerability assessment areas, particularly about 165 districts, and also is about that how to prioritize about the disaster resilience work, particularly about the capacity building ultimately leading to making these risks visible, um, making people who may be experiencing climate impacts but not necessarily episodic disasters more eligible, and at the same time improving their adaptive capacity to become more capable. So visible, capable, and eligible. I feel uh, we could broadly divide um, the system's approach into looking at, of course, rapid response as one of them in ensuring business continuity, in enabling rapid recovery. So cash-based programming is one such area. In India, every year, it's uh, 2.5 million people get displaced from rural areas, then they add to cities. Uh, maybe, I think it's like a big city is added to cities every year just because of disasters, and that is driven by livelihoods. And what Sasser said about the livelihoods coping, they enter into coping, coping mechanisms are more risky livelihoods. And again, because we're talking about vulnerabilities, the population is not same. Among the population, their vulnerability levels are different. Their population, again, we look at women, children, they get exposed to a different level of risks and vulnerabilities when they, when they undertake this kind of a migration. And where do they end up in cities, urbans? I think we need to start talking about urban. I think the landscape in India is changing. From rural, we are becoming more urban, but we are becoming more vulnerable urban. Through my assessment that if the property rights are retained, if suppose say the people just move out, but the land is left on its own, if there is natural regeneration of the mangrove forest, not plantation mangroves, the total net benefit between 2050, the net present value generated between 2050 to 2100 is 12.8 times of business as usual.
If you can um, provide uh, funding uh, through a zero interest loan, Sharia compliant, uh, you can um, mobilize uh, people to utilize uh, the, the cash that they need in the quantities they need at the time they need um, and by creating a, a moral obligation. Disasters are gender blind, but their impact is not. Women continue to face um, a differential um, you know, impact on their lives, their families' lives, their livelihoods, and in every which way they and they, they suffer, as the chair just mentioned, some of the immediate things that women face and the immediate impact of disasters that women face results into poor health services, number one. And those are the things that are visible. And I'll talk about what are the other things that are not visible on the ground. Violence. We saw how uh, the, the violence, number of violence issues increased threefold after COVID. Um, Trafficking of girls and women for different purposes. Uh, food and nutrition, the health status. Their education, when parents have to choose between boys and girls' education, girls are the first ones to be taken out of the school and education system, also because of lack of money and funds with the, with the families. Child marriage is an immediate impact that we saw after COVID and after any disaster, we see how girls get married at the age of 14, 15, because parents think that that will reduce their burden, particularly in terms of food. Um, the reproductive health. It just so happened, and, and I'm sure all of us observed that when COVID happened, we forgot that there are pregnant women. There are women who are suffering from from uh, anemia, there are women who need, or girls who are suffering because of various reproductive um, ailments. We completely forgot about that. And so they suffer the most, in any case, women are the last ones to seek services, and then disaster happens, and then the menstrual cycles are, are uh, not regular, they don't get access to sanitary napkins, they don't get access to con counseling services or health services. So those are some of the the tangible things that we see on the ground. But otherwise, if you see women's role in decision making in terms of um, uh, damage assessment, um, post-disaster need assessment and recovery plans are generally, you will see, are uh, gender blind. The women are not included in pre or post uh, disaster uh, discussions. If you look at the livelihood approaches itself, they talk about households as a unit of analysis and household as unit of analysis will not give you uh, our women make women very invisible in your approaches or need assessment uh, let me point out to the fang companies we talk about facebook amazon apple netflix google they have changed the world it's, it's the younger generation which has used the technology so socially connecting us on a common platform that's what they have given us integrating logistics and delivery of goods and services very, very effectively. That's what uh, these companies have done. And navigating through the cities and towns, 20 years ago, we couldn't even imagine. And today, with those kind of maps, you are able to do it. So I think we could uh, organize some road shows and tap the talent in these institutions besides uh, the private sector. Another area where private sector and NGO CSO could be tapped is for uh, supporting infrastructure development in a PPP model. Every dollar spent in uh, prevention, mitigation, upfront, uh, saves you roughly five to 10 times in terms of response. So my urge would be that, can we do something whereby we can build forward better, as the chair suggested, uh, so that we, we, we spend less on response and we spend more in terms of uh, protecting the people. We talk about livelihood, the skills, market, and finance is a core. So SSP is, uh, has a model of uh, supporting these women for enterprise uh, development uh, right from uh, agriculture domain. So it's more of agri and agri-allied, setting up agri and agri-allied enterprises and involved all women at, yeah, at, at all, all the stages. So when we talk about agriculture right from farm produce, uh, processing and uh, s um, taking it to the market by involving the large corporates in, including the retail uh, sales network we create. So we are working around 300,000 women uh, farmers, uh, including entrepreneurs, where 75,000 women entrepreneurs are part of this whole ecosystem. In Assam, where reliance is also part of the coordination mechanism, 
and and i think thanks for you for all of you to support it with the data data systems and small data uh, analysis uh, and i think that's very helpful uh, but the point i want to make is that there is space for on time need based um, humanitarian cash transfers uh, particularly to address the most vulnerable who are impacted by flood or drought or whatever because the the blanket uh, humanitarian cash transfers are not working for everyone so in this uh, kachar case it's it's the families who have severe acute malnourished children which are being targeted by by the humanitarian cash transfer so uh, such acute vulnerabilities are plenty in this country and i think that's a space where Reliance Foundation can get in. One is an area of awakening because a lot of people believe uh, no, needs to be supported in terms of that it's that there are big impacts that disasters do create and, and climate change is creating, but uh, especially on livelihoods, but they are reversible and manageable and a lot of people needs to be educated needs to be informed up uh, and supported especially at the front line and at the grassroots level so awareness knowledge use of data sciences early warning systems uh, retrofitting there's a whole lot of things that are are part of that work stream people centric approach equipping or capacitating people for a speedy and efficient recovery of the uh, livelihood in the post disaster scenario so thus it all starts with equipping local governance to execute development planning by considering the risk factor, thus doing a risk-informed or risk-integrated development planning process. Thus, for every action we do for the development of a local area or state, the future risk to be uh, taken into consideration and uh, necessary planning should be done. Insurance, that entire discourse of insurance and risk insurance and reinsurance, hazard risk, is somewhere, you know, gets lost in the overall financial framework. So DRF and I, so disaster risk financing and insurance, but that I is never discussed very seriously. It is time we bring the I to the forefront and discuss what is it that MSMEs can be done. A supply chain, the forward backward elements of the supply chain has to remain the, the wheel has to remain running 365 days whereas the agriculture and the biological production systems are highly seasonal so if you have to superimpose the backward forward part of this into the life the seasonal life systems what happens is you have to bring the scope into that, in the sense that you have to understand the generic part of the supply chain and the specialized part of the supply chain. You're looking at enhancing community resilience by protection and rehabilitation of agricultural land. We did hear from Mr. Vatsa that agriculture might be not one of the primary sectors, but food is. So we really do need to address that. And one thought I would like to leave us all with, and that is something which is part of the One UN, which is the whole concept of One Health. Particularly in the wake of the pandemic, we are looking more at linking animal and human health information to provide warning of shared risks and environmental hazards. Which can aid in all the work which we are doing right now here, I'm aware that there are certain uh, digital infrastructure which are already placed uh, by, the, by the United Nations agencies and also by the NDMA. We need to have those kind of infrastructure also integrated with the various uh, non-governmental and then corporate uh, teams so that they can leverage the information out of it. I think it's been um, a very, very rich uh, discussion and we're, we're very much looking forward to taking this ahead with all of you um, over lunch, uh, over the coming months. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.